Okay, uh, great. So uh, for our second talk of the first uh, dot session of uh, this semester, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Elina Romberg, who's a senior associate professor at Binchopping University in Sweden. Uh, her research is uh, obviously in discrete optimization um, with a special focus on decomposition methods um, uh, and uh, column generation, dancing wolf decomposition, uh, branch and price and so on. And uh, her work has uh, been applied in uh, problems such as uh, aircraft uh, electronic systems, uh, staff scheduling in healthcare, uh, railway crew planning, um, and so on. And uh, today she's going to tell us about uh, speeding up integer programming for uh, column generation for various classes of problems. So Irina, please take it away. Oh. So thank you, Elias, for, for the introduction. And uh, I will present some work that Steve Meyer and I did to improve the computational performance of, of branch and pricey uh, for set positioning, packing, and, and covering problems. And let's see. If Ah, it's a bit slow. Um, yes, so what we've done is to design an LNS uh, for extended formulations. And we implemented this in GCG, which is a generic branch price and cut solver in, in SKIP. Uh, and the goal of this project was to, to improve the general performance of, of GCG for, for difficult instances. So we're interested in, in, in improving in the solver um, overall. And the reason for, for starting this project uh, is that um, in generic MIP solvers, the LNS heuristics are really important, but it all has also turned out to be very challenging to extend them to the setting where columns are, are generated. And also, when you think about column generation in general, it's designed to solve uh, linear programs. So there is some unexplored potential here that we wanted to, to see what we could do with. And what we've done is to implement an LNS of destroy repair type. So the, the basic scheme is very simple. Uh, you have a destroy method where you remove columns from a current solution, and then you repair this, this solution by solving a, a submit where you use column from a specialized repair pricing scheme. But, but the key here and the important part is, is this repair pricing scheme. How do you find columns that are meaningful to, to use in your submit to find an improved solution? So the outline of my talk is that I will, will um, give some more details about, about the background so that you understand the, the context here, and, and then an overview of, of the heuristic that we designed, and then some computational results. And throughout this talk, I will use a, a VRP example, uh, and uh, this is to give some intuition of what's going on. So we will use this as an example when we think about what we do. And here you can think about having three vehicles and you, they need to visit all the customers and you want to minimize the travel time. And if you would make a compact formulation of this problem, you would have a decision variable that says if vehicle Q uses an arc or not. And then you will have some constraints saying that will make the, the routes feasible for the vehicles. And then uh, you need to make sure that they cover all the customers. Another way to, to, to think about this problem would be to say that, okay, but what if we enumerate all the routes and we specify the route by, by a parameter that says if, if the route visits a customer or not? And then you can take the constraints that, that uh, makes the, the route's vehicle uh, feasible into account when you, when you generate these routes. So that would be a different perspective. And then you can have a variable, a decision variable that says, uh, if a vehicle uses a route or not. And then the only thing your constraints need to take care of is to make sure that you have one route per vehicle and that you cover all the customers. But there is a problem here, of course, because for, for any reasonable instance, you cannot enumerate all the routes. You will have a combinatorial explosion. And here is where, where column generation becomes of uh, interest. So in column generation, instead of having what would be a complete master problem with all the routes, you add promising ones to a restricted master problem. And this is typically a much smaller subset than, than the complete set of columns. And one important thing to keep in mind here is that when we talk about column generation, it's about solving the LP relaxation of this problem. And this is probably also a good point in time to, to mention that when I talk about a route or a column, that's the same thing here, and they will correspond to a variable in my master problem or in my restricted master problem. 
Uh, and it, it was a nice thing to have a talk about the simplex method before this one, uh, because I mean, column generation is essentially the simplex method. But instead of having all the variables at hand and then look at, okay, here's one with a negative reduced cost and then uh, pivot on that variable, you solve a pricing problem to generate a new column and then you pivot on, on the corresponding variable. And what you do then is that you can, you can stop generating columns when you don't find anyone with a negative reduced cost. So that's why you don't need all the columns typically. But when we started, we were interested in solving the integer program. And to do this, you need to perform, you can perform some branching, maybe add some cuts to find your integer solution. Uh, and if you combine this with, with generating columns in each node, then you will get branch and price and cut. Uh, and when we talk about branching, if we look at the compact formulation we had, here's an example with two variables and uh, where the second one is fractional. If you would branch on this variable, then you would say that either you need to force the vehicle to use this arc or, or you forbid the vehicle to use this arc. If we instead look at the extended formulation, then, uh, and also again, the second variable is fractional and then we branch on that one. Then we would say that, okay, we should force a complete route to be used or we should forbid one route to be used. But what we also need to do if we, want to make sure that we don't use this route, we need to prevent it from ever being generated again in, in this branch. And this is the tricky part for the extended formulation because that, then we need to say to our pricing problem that, okay, we should, we should solve this problem again, but there is exactly one solution or, or one uh, route that we cannot generate. And that's typically not a good thing to, to, to model and, in, and have in, in, in your pricing problem. So, and, and this is a well-known challenge in branch of price. So, so what you do then is instead of this naive branching on the extended variables, you branch on variables of the corresponding compact formulation. The nice thing about this is that it translates again to omitting or using one arc in the pricing problem. And that's easy to handle. If you think about our, our routes say, okay, we, we need to include this arc or we shouldn't include this arc. And also, this is the reason I would say that when you, when you look at, at uh, column generation papers, there, there is typically a, a section about how they did the branching. And this is the reason, because that's the tricky part here to, to handle. Uh, and why am I talking about branching? My talk was supposed to be about LNS design, um, because we have the same type of, of challenges when we design LNS heuristics in this context. Uh, so, so we, if we look at the LNS heuristics again, um, like I said before, they are, are a really important component in the branch and bound based MIP solvers. And, and what's common for these heuristics uh, are that um, you solve an auxiliary problem to find an improved integer solution. This is also known as submipping. And for what's common also for these are that you, you form these um, auxiliary problems by fixing variables in, in some way. And then we're back to the same issue that like we had in the branching. If we want to fix variables to zero, we need to handle that in some way. So, so this is the background. This is where we want to contribute. How, how do we handle um, creating submips in, in, in a reasonable way? So again, the, the outline of the heuristic, as I said in the introduction, it's very simple. We, we have a, a current solution where we remove columns and then we, we repair it by, by running our repair pricing scheme. And then we solve this submit using these columns. And to explain um, how we generate the columns, I would use some illustrations and we can still think about our VRP uh, problem. So one column here is a binary vector that corresponds to a route and indicates if the customer is visited by the vehicle or not. And if we look at the feasible solution, it could look something like this for a set petitioning problem that we have five columns here that um, covers each customer exactly once. And the decision variables, uh, the lambdas here, say if the column, uh, a column of a certain pricing problem is used or not. And this gives us a model formulation that looks like this. And if we start looking here at the lambda set, then uh, it says that the variables should be binary. And we have a cardinality constraint here that says how many columns we should use from each of our pricing problems. And then we want to minimize the cost in this case. Um, but the important thing to look at here um, 
it is the the constraints the, the covering and the packing constraints so in our illustration it looks something like this that for each row here this row should be greater than or equal to one the sum here should be less than or equal to one and in our derivation is we, we only consider covering and packing because um, for the partitioning constraints, we can uh, just duplicate it and have one of each. So that handles that case. So if we go back to, to the actual method, and now we're, we're in, in the context, uh, in, in um, the situation that we have generated some columns to our restricted master problem, and then we have um, a solution um, among these columns. So this is our current solution. And what we do then is to just remove some of the columns. Um, that's our destroy method. And an interesting question to ask then is, OK, what would be the best possible way to repair this solution? So now we consider these columns fixed. And what can we do to, to improve? Or what's the best way to improve? And the best way to improve this would be to solve this problem, where this is the fixed part. We move it to the right-hand side. And then we solve the, the problem that we have uh, over all possible columns. Uh, and if we would do that, we would get an optimal solution, which I will display like this. But of course, this is not something that we should do because this is yeah, more or less as difficult as solving the original problem. And to do that just for one iteration, it doesn't make sense. But we, we can think about these ideal columns as something to aim for, because we actually know some things about these columns. So if we look at the situation here, we have a fixed part from our, our current solution, the columns that we saved and, and the ones that would be the ideal ones. And what we know about this uh, is that some of them here, the sum will be zero, greater than or equal to one, equal to zero or equal to one. Okay, but if we know this, then we also know something about the ideal ones. Uh, we know that together, this should be greater than or equal to one, for these, anything would be okay. These ones together, less than or equal to one, and all of these needs to be zero. So if we look at this again, so, so this is what we know, and this gives us something to aim for. So, and I mean, since it's not reasonable to define this, let's say that we find a bunch of columns, a set of columns um, that we think are similar to these ones. Uh, so, and, and we treat them in an average sense. So let's say we, we take four of each, uh, and, and then we don't look at each individual column here, but we look at a quarter of each of these. Then the, the conditions we had here, they hold also for, for this set when it's about to approximate this one. So this gives us something to aim for, uh, for this larger set of columns that we generate. But, but how, do we, how do we reach this? So we, we have some properties now that we want to aim for. These are our repair pricing uh, columns that we want to generate. So the anything is OK condition is easy to take care of because, I mean, we don't have anything to worry about then. And then we have uh, the condition that says they all have to be equal to zero. That simply means we can put a big M penalty on the corresponding AIs in our pricing problem. Just say we cannot use this arc. Uh, the somewhat trickier part are, are the together constraints. And, and I think that my intuition is that you could handle this in, in different ways, but we came up with, with one way of handling it in this paper. And if you consider the columns, I, I talked about them to, to think about them in, in an average sense. Uh, and then you could like measure the progress to see if all of these would, would have looked the same and contributed equally in each of the iterations uh, that you would make what would the status be after a certain iteration? And based on this, we came up with a closed form formula that helps us measure the progress in some sense. Uh, if you're interested in the details of this, we, we have everything in, in the paper. But, but what we need to, I mean, the important thing is here is that we have some simple calculations and comparisons we can do in each iteration to understand if, if we, um, are on a good path of, of, of contributing to these constraints in the way we should. And, and if not, then we can um, have, we have dynamic penalties on the corresponding AIs that we can adjust so that we get closer to this value in the next iteration. 
So if we look at the resulting uh, repair pricing problem, uh, then I first display the, the somewhat standard things. We have Lagrangian reduced costs here with respect to the covering and packing constraints. The columns should be feasible. And then we have the penalties that I just introduced. Uh, so we have a big pen M penalty here, the ones that has to be zero and the dynamic ones here. Then we also have, uh, in this talk, I will call it a magic parameter. It's a parameter here in the reduced costs. And this is a result from, from a previous work that we did uh, where we show that it, it's a good idea to put a, a parameter between zero and one here. And, and I, I won't have time to go into the details of why this makes sense, uh, but it has to do with the fact that we're interested in solving an integer program and not a, a, a linear program. Uh, but it, it takes some time to explain this, but we will just use it here. So um, the implementation we did in GCG, and, and here I, I uh, also want to mention that uh, when it comes to the implementation and the computational testing, uh, Steve deserves all the credit. He did all the work with, with this. Uh, and he had the background of, of implementing things in Skip uh, that was needed to, to do this. Um, so it's been implemented as part of the branch, pattern, <laughs> branch price and cut scheme in GCG. And what we do is that we apply this heuristic in the root node, and we do it when the tailing off for the L relaxation begins. Uh, and the reason for doing this is also a result from, from the previous paper that I mentioned, that we learned that you shouldn't use the optimal dual solutions. You should use some, other, some that are near optimal. And also something that we, we um, made sense already when we started the project is that we this is a, an expensive heuristic to run. You generate a lot of columns uh, and uh, you should probably not do it if you're solving a problem that is easy to solve. We need this when, when we have a challenging problem. Uh, and, and then we thought, okay, maybe looking at the optimality gap in the root node is, an, is a good measure. Uh, so, and um, when I display the results later on, you will see that we, we show all the results as a function of, of the optimality gap in, in the root node. Uh, something that wasn't clear when we started implementing this was if we should use it in the root node only, uh, or if we could use it in, in, in the further down the tree also. Uh, it was clear that we shouldn't use it in all the nodes because it's expensive, uh, but yeah, it turned out to be a good idea to use it every now and then. And also when we look at the results, um, we, we uh, implemented this and used it in addition to all other heuristics that are in GCG already, because we wanted to see, can we improve the state of the art of, of, of this solver by including this heuristic? So uh, when we look at the results, uh, today I will show the, the primal integral, since this is a common way to measure the progress of heuristics. And there you, can, there you look at each point, for each point in time, you take the integral of the primal gap as a function of time. And I will also show you some primal and optimality gap, gaps after one hour of runtime. Uh, we have a, a very diverse test set. So we use shifted geometric means for everything. Um, and what we do is that we display uh, these measures as a ratio, the, the ratio with and without using the heuristic. And as I mentioned before, all the results, I show them as a function of the, this first call gap. And, and this is a lot of detail, at least I think. Uh, so essentially, when I show you a plot and we have a value that's less than one, it means that we improve the performance of the solver. So that this is what we should look for. Um, and our first test set, we, we took instances that are that make sense to solve by column iteration. So um, with known block diagonal structures. And if you look at this plot here, we have on the x-axis, we have the, the first call gap, the, the optimality gap in the root node. Uh, and then we have the number of instances here. And then we can see that some of the instances have a small gap already there, but we have a tail here with the challenging instances. And those are the ones that we are interested in. And then we show the results for some of the parameter settings here. Gamma, the, the magic parameter, and this is the initial penalty when we start running the the, the scheme. So if we first look at the optimality gap, then we can see that for, for all of the instances, we, we improve the, the, the gap after 
one hour. And um, that makes sense because our heuristic generates columns that the, the branch and price wouldn't otherwise find. So this makes sense. But, but an interesting question is, okay, does it pay off with respect to the time it takes? And here, I, I think this uh, uh, shows really well that for, for the easy instances, it doesn't pay off because it takes too much time to run the heuristic. Of course, the solutions were better if, if, the ch if, if we didn't solve it within an hour, but, but still, on average, it doesn't make sense. But if we look here for the more difficult instances, then, then we see an improvement. And this was what we aimed for. So, so essentially, it, it behaves as, as we wanted it to or as we expected. Um, and then when we, after making these tests, then we thought, OK, but what happens if we take some more instances that we don't know that much about? So we extracted some instances from Midlib, and we just picked everything with, with the, the tags, the compositions, and covering packing, and so on. We, we don't really have any idea what these instances are. But um, the, the DCG implementation is amazing because it has automatic structure detection and uh, does both the composition. So if you like, you can throw anything at it. It will try to find a structure and decompose and, and run it. But we don't. We have no idea how, how uh, this decomposition is done here and the structure or anything. But it, get, it gave us an additional set of instances where we again see the easy ones and then the tail with the more difficult ones. And the results are, are very similar. We see an improvement of, of the gap and. Um, um, when, when, when we look at the primal integral, we see for the easier ones, then it doesn't pay off, but for, for the more difficult ones, it, it does. So, so same type of results as before. Okay. So just some concluding comments. Um, we implemented this heuristic and it actually behaves like we intended it to. And it helps UCG to find high quality integer solutions. And, and then it improves the computational performance for the difficult ones. Uh, we also have a, a preprint available uh, that we, we, which includes detailed derivation of the, the pricing scheme. I, I just briefly explained it today, I think. Uh, and then more tests and performance measures and uh, analysis for, for different parameter settings and an extension of the restricted master heuristic uh, that, that's also called uh, price and branch uh, to, to use it together with that so that you don't need to do any branching at all. Uh, but, but I think uh, also that this is a rather preliminary paper. I think there's several opportunities for improvements of both the theory and the implementation. So um, thank you for listening and yep, questions. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Lina, for that great talk. Okay, so uh, Elina actually did beat the clock. So there is time for live questions. Mm -hmm. um, and afterwards, as Alex said, uh, you can also stick around and uh, yeah, just hang out or ask the speakers a few more questions. So I, I have one question, Alina. Um, mm -hmm. So it, for the MIPLIB results, does mm -hmm. um, is there, I know that, I think there are different, I don't remember exactly, but I think in GCG, in the automatic decomposition, um, there are different types of decompositions that it can run. Um, and then depend, like there's an arrow type or some uh, other ones uh, that, that it does, it tries to automatically detect. Do you have a sense of like the results are better for one type versus another, or is that not something that you looked at, or it makes sense to ask? No, I mean, it could be interesting to see what GCG actually did, uh, because um, as I, I understand it, I mean, it chooses the, the, the structure that gives you the best, block diagonal structure it can find and then it tries with that one uh, but what it actually contains it i have no idea for the instances that we tested was that an answer to your question yeah yeah i think that's uh, yeah I, I, I was just yeah that, that answered it thank you but because for our other instances where we knew what type of decomposition we wanted then you can specify also what you wanted to do um yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, basically the question is like, can you start to tailor your decomposition to your method? That's kind of maybe like a higher level question. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, but that then that would be to decide how to, if you have your own application, how should I decompose it? And exactly, given yeah, that this so, method might work for it. Yeah, exactly, and and then you're back to considering, okay, what is a good way of decomposing? What What structure does your pricing problems get? How can you solve them? <laughs> you want them to be, um, I mean, you don't, you prefer the, that they don't have integrality property, but they, they shouldn't be dif too difficult to solve what remains in your master and, and so on. Then you're back to the like um, structure discussion, I think. Yeah. Um, no, but this is a good question and, and it would be interesting to to understand if the structure affects the, the computational results. Um, we, we have now we just threw everything at it and just okay, what happens? Um, Any other questions? One more quick question for me if nobody else asks, but let me give it one more 30 seconds or five seconds. So uh, for... I actually uh, Elena, oh, had a ahead. question about interpreting the plots. I know you said just below one is good and above is bad, but if you could go back to any of these plots, I was just trying to uh, think about how to interpret, uh, like if we take the primal integral plot and we take yep. one, one x, y point, so mm -hmm. does that correspond to one instance? No, th this is for, for all of the instances. So then if we look exactly here at, at where mm -hmm. it intersects this line, then it means that it takes, uh, if we look at overall for, for all the instances with a gap up to this value, it, the, um, the value is the same with and without the heuristic. And here, mm -hmm. the primal integral is worse for, for, for um, these instances, and here it's better. Um, mm -hmm. Was that an answer to the question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around how the distribution is, is, is summarized over, like how the averaging is happening over the instances. Uh, yes. That's the part that's uh, yeah. a bit, but I think I understand what's going on, yeah. Yeah. So, so if it would would have been time instead, then it's the 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 average time for all the instances with one method and the other, and then you look at the ratio, and is mm -hmm. the ratio greater than or equal to one or less than or equal to one? Um, and and for each x value, it's the instances like here, all the instances mm -hmm. with a gap that's up at to most, zero. Yeah. yeah, at most that. Okay. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that's the part that was. That yeah, was yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, so Alex, should we start the social?